Kidney function declines during aging, but does it have to? Let's take a look at the data. So first, what we're looking at is a graph of kidney function uh, plotted against age. And what we can see is that uh, kidney function starts off very high with, the, uh, with an average uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate, EGFR, of about 125 in uh, youth, in 20-year-olds, and then it decreases to values around 50 in people uh, that are 90 years old or older. So uh, what is that? Let's just break it down a little bit. What does that even mean, the GFR estimate or the EGFR? So um, starting from uh, uh, good kidney function, uh, EGFR is at least 90, more than 90. Uh, but as uh, we age, uh, kidney function can decline. Uh, in this case, I've uh, pointed out uh, stage 2 kidney disease, which is a mild loss of kidney function, uh, which is defined as an EGFR between 60 and 89. Now, kidney function further declines during aging, to uh, moderate to severe loss of function with EG, EGFR values from 30 to 59. And for some, uh, kidney function can continue uh, to decline with EGFR values of 15 to 29 being stage four kidney disease where there's a severe loss of function or stage five kidney disease where EGFR is zero to 15. Uh, in that case, people would need treatment to live uh, such as uh, hemodialysis. So what about all-cause mortality risk? Well, an EGFR less than 45 is associated with an increased risk of death for all causes in a meta-analysis of 46 studies that included more than 2 million subjects. That's what we can see here. So when compared with subjects who had EGFR values of 95, uh, having an EGFR less than 45 was associated with a, significantly risk of uh, a significant increased risk of death for all causes. So can kidney function be improved during aging? And uh, what's my data? So uh, here we're looking at uh, my blood test data starting in 2006 through 2013. And I've been tracking my own circulating biomarkers for about 15 years. Uh, now, back then, I was only tracking about once a year. When I'd go to the doctor, I would just record all my data in an Excel file. Um, so what we can see is uh, over eight measurements over that seven-year period, my average EGFR was uh, 86. So how does that, uh, how does that rank when, we, when looking at the uh, age-related graph on the right? So uh, on the x-axis, I've um, arrowed my age, and then on the y-axis, we can see my uh, 86 uh, EGFR. Now, for my age during that period, we could have expected my uh, EGFR to be somewhere around 90, so one could say that I was, uh, my kidneys were aging at an average rate. Um, so what about since then? Uh, I'm currently 48, so what about over the past uh, eight years? So starting in 2015, I started measuring uh, my circulating biomarkers more often, uh, up to six times a year. Uh, now, based on the aging, uh, uh, the age-related decrease for kidney function graph, one could expect that my EGFR should have been further reduced uh, relative to the 86, somewhere around 78. So how's my data? Uh, so that's what we're looking at here. So the 2015 to 2020 data for my EGFR, and what we can see is my average EGFR has increased to somewhere around 97. So, uh, and I should say that these two groups of data are significantly different based on a t-test. So I've actually uh, reversed the age-related decline in kidney function and improved my kidney function closer towards youth. And uh, when extrapolating based on the curve, these are uh, average uh, kidney function values that are found in someone about 15 years younger than my actual, my chronological age. So how have I improved uh, my kidney function? So uh, in 2015, I started tracking, uh, uh, weighing all my food and tracking ma macro and micronutrients. So I have more than five years, five and a half, more, actually it's up to six, six years now, we're in a 2021, uh, almost six years of dietary data for macros and micros. And then in July of 2018, I started uh, uh, logging the actual food intakes. So I have 880 days of, of uh, tracked food intake that correspond to 13 EGFR measurements. So um, Let's start off with that data. Which food groups are strong, uh, strongly correlated with my EGFR? So um, of all the food groups, uh, my average total vegetable uh, a daily, sorry, my average daily vegetable intake in sum is correlated with a high GFR. And that's what we're looking at here. EGFR plotted on the y-axis against the, my average daily vegetable intake in grams per day on the x-axis. And what we can see is that uh, the correlation coefficient between my average vegetable intake with EGFR is strong with a correlation coefficient of 0.79. Now, uh, the R squared for that then corresponds to 63% of the variability 
in EGFR being explained by the sum of my vegetable intake every day. And this correlation for EGFR with my total vegetable intake is statistically significant based on the p-value. Now note that uh, this isn't the recommended five servings of vegetables per day. Um, this is uh, almost uh, at the high end up to 2,000 grams of vegetables a day, uh, which corresponds to about 25 servings of vegetables a day using 80 grams as a standard serving size. Now, uh, included in that average vegetable intake are, you know, carrots, pep red bell peppers, lots of broccoli and cauliflower, um, uh, in addition to other, other vegetables too. So 63% uh, of the variability in EGFR being explained by my total vegetable intake is pretty good, but can the inclusion of other foods explain more of the variance for kidney function? So to examine that, I then looked at uh, food groups. So uh, that's what I've listed here. So uh, the sum of all my dairy intake, which includes yogurt, whey protein, and um, cheese, and then nuts and seeds. Now, not all nuts and seeds are not the same. They have different chemical composition, including different fatty acid compositions. So I separated my nuts and seeds into, uh, uh, or into groupings. So uh, saturated fat uh, containing um, nuts and seeds, for example, uh, cocoa beans and coconut butter, which are uh, mostly saturated fat. MUFA, mostly monounsaturated fatty acid containing nuts and seeds. So in that situation, it would be um, almonds, uh, pecans, and peanuts which are rich in, in monounsaturated fatty acids. And then not all PUFA, poly, polyunsaturated fatty acids are the same as they have differing uh, saturate, uh, 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 fatty acid uh, concentrations. For example, flaxseed is rich in omega-3, whereas nuts like walnuts, sesame seeds, and sunflower seeds are rich in omega-6. So I grouped my uh, nuts and seeds based on their primary uh, uh, fatty acid compositions. Um, so then total vegetables, fruit, uh, which, uh, in, which was my total sum of my berry intake, uh, sardines, beef, and eggs. So all of those food groups, those 10 variables, I entered them into a backward elimination regression model. And what does that mean? So with that type of a regression model, variables are sequentially removed um, until the best performing regression model remains. So all 10 variables go in the model to start. And then uh, when you get the output data, say one of the variables has a p-value of 0 0.9, which is high, that's then removed from the uh, uh, regression model. So now you have nine variables in the model, and that continues until you're left with the best performing model. So what model uh, was, uh, was able to best explain um, more of the variance in EGFR? And that's what we're looking at here. So the combination of sardines, my sardine intake, my beef intake, and my total vegetable intake was able to explain 70% uh, the adjusted R squared of the variability in EGFR. So higher intake of sardines and vegetables and a lower intake of beef is correlated with a higher GFR. And again, higher G GFR being found in youth, uh, obviously being a good thing. And we can see the significance of that model, the significance F, has a p-value lower than 0.05, which means that the combination of these three foods or food groups is significantly correlated with EGFR. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, for fish, fish has been, and there's there aren't very many studies on this. If anybody's got some studies on fish, the, uh, the correlation between fish intake and kidney function, please send them over because uh, I scoured the literature looking for that data and uh, there are very few studies that have investigated it. Nonetheless, I did find one of these studies where a higher fish intake was correlated with a higher EGFR, and that's what we see here in the uh, plot. So uh, investigating further, uh, I mentioned that I also have uh, um, macronutrient data starting from 2015, so I have a lot more data for that uh, with more blood tests. So which vegetable, fish, or beef components are uh, affecting kidney function or are at least correlated with kidney function? So uh, that's what we see here. Um, and uh, my fiber intake, my daily fiber intake, my average uh, daily intake of omega-3 fatty acids and protein are significantly correlated with EGFR. And note uh, first that I've got, you know, the observations column uh, is arrowed. So I have, tw this is data for 28 blood tests. And what we can see is that a higher intake of fiber and omega-3, but a lower intake of uh, uh, protein is correlated with a higher EGFR. But also note that the adjusted R squared is obviously lower. In this case, it's uh, 40% of the variability in EGFR can be explained by my protein intake, fiber, and omega-3s, which isn't surprising because, you know, I'm, a, I'm attempting to reduce my food intake to macronutrients, whereas foods, uh, you know, have way more than, you know, just these nutrients. So nonetheless, 40% of the var variability in EGFR with just these three macronutrients is a significant amount. 
All right, so how, how could fiber be related to EGFR? So fiber is fermented by gut bacteria to produce short-chain fatty acids, SCFAs, and that's what we see here uh, in the left uh, picture. So uh, carbohydrates that escape absorption in the small intestine pass into the large intestine, where they're then fermented by uh, gut bacteria into the short-chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate, which I've got boxed or rect rectangled. So why is butyrate important? Well, as shown here, uh, the higher the levels of butyrate in stool samples, which would be produced by gut bacteria because gut bacteria are in stool, the higher the concentration of uh, butyrate or butyric acid, the higher uh, the EGFR. So with this in mind, this suggests that a higher fiber intake, there would be an increased gut bacterial pr production of butyrate and better kidney function. So that's all I've got for now. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for watching if you made it to the end and have a great day.